The only one in Britain to name a famous businessman, and they'll almost certainly say Alan Sugar, or Lord Sugar, Baron of Clapton, to give him his fancy new title. You might know him as the self-made millionaire behind Amstrad in the 80s, or the unpopular owner of Tottenham Hotspur in the 90s, or the bad-tempered TV boss in The Apprentice. But none of us have met the real man behind the public persona until now. I've been given exclusive access to Lord Sugar's home and life in Florida. What's the biggest check you could write right now? Over 100 million and it would get paid. To get under the skin of this famously private figure. Were well, you looking at yourself on telly thinking, yeah, you're fat? And I'll be taking him back to his childhood stomping ground to see how it shaped the man that he is today. Did he ever strike his cleverest little blue? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is Alan Sugar as you've never seen him before. I feel gutted. Totally got a broken heart. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Which means you must have a heart. As I find out the truth about the man behind the desk. Have you ever woken up and thought, Alan, I'm wrong? Yeah. Being this, we get it. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Miami. Just north of Florida's favourite flesh spot, Miami, and south of Ritzy Palm Beach, Boca Raton is a nine hour flight from London. Jig it out. Not that convenient for most of us, but if you only fly by private jet, as Lord Sugar does, then it's a dog. Right, Captain. Let's go find him. This is one of the most affluent neighbourhoods in America. And only multi-millionaires like Lord Sugar can afford to live here. Lord Sugar. Yes, how are you? How lovely to see nice you to in your see you. rambling Boca Raton mansion. Yes, and you're turning up in the style that you're accustomed <laughs> to. Yeah. This is very civilised for you. Yeah, very, very nice, isn't it? I wasn't expecting very this. Calming, very calming. It's very calming. Yeah. Very quiet and peaceful, a bit like yeah. you, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll show you around. I mean, obviously, even you've worked out that's a swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this house originally stopped, so I bought this plot, and then we attached this other... So you built the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't build it myself. I'm mean, no. commissioned builders to do it. Uh, being the, you know, nice, easygoing fellow, as you can imagine. You can imagine you enjoy yeah. the work. Yeah. Lord Sugar's villa is set on one of Boca Raton's most prestigious waterside addresses. With eight bedrooms and his very own jetty, it's valued at an estimated seven and a half million dollars. Who's top dog in Boca Raton? I don't know. I don't know. You I really must don't. be near no, the top. No, 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 no. I don't think. It depends. Are there billionaires here? Yeah. Uh, well, it depends how they value themselves. You you know? Are you a billionaire? No. In dollar terms, mm, mm, just about virgin on it. Do you like money? Um, it's not my god. You know, it isn't. I've accumulated it. I've made it. It's not my god. It really isn't my god. If money is not your god, what is? I just, I like a deal. You know, I like, I like a deal. I like to be busy. On the Sunday Times Rich List, you Sorry. appear to be getting poorer. I, mean, yeah. I find that hard to believe. I will say this. They should have a different list. A list of, come forward, someone who can write a cheque out now for £100 million. Write the cheque and put it into the bank and get it paid. How and many of them do you think could I pass that I don't test? think too many of them would. Now, I'm not, you know... I mean, I, I could, OK, because that's the way I run my business What's my the biggest cheque you could write right now? Uh, over £100 million and it would get paid. Do you yeah. realise you're actually wealthier than Sir Paul McCartney? Who wrote some of the greatest songs in I, history? Uh, I, 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 do you think that's fair, that you should have more than him? Well, I think he's done very well, considering he's a musician. Well, I'm looking at a, a body of work of the emailer, yeah. the sky dishes, yeah. and some... A load of few computers we made. And a few computers yeah, against a few million, yeah. yesterday, Hey Jude and Let It Be. Okay. Which do you think is going to leave the longest legacy? That, that, without a question of a doubt, um, the emailer. <laughs> In 1968, Alan Sugar founded the company that made him the wealthy man he is today. Amstrad stands for Alan Michael Sugar Trading. So quite straightforward, it's all about Alan. The business started out with these amazing double dick sort of cassette hi-fis with a record player on the top. Amstrad twin cassette decks to tape tapes, 289 pounds. I had one of those. Trading in mostly hi-fi equipment, the business grew steadily until 1980, when it was floated on the stock market. The deal was to make the 33-year-old Sugar an overnight millionaire. When you made your first million, you actually had a cheque, didn't you, for the amount? It was actually 
two million was the first. Two million, but yeah. that's the moment you became a millionaire yeah, physically. Yeah, yeah. And what did um, that feel like? And it felt great. You know, it was a deal in getting all these merchant bankers and uh, and uh, accountants and everybody else asking questions and always wondering, is this going to happen? Is this actual flotation going to happen? And there came the final day when the merchant bank at the time of Climate Benson signed the piece of paper and the prospectus was published. And then they were, they, they, they were kind of knackered then. There was no pulling back. That was it. That was the day that I knew I'd made two million quid from, from nowhere. Be under no illusion, by 1980, I was doing very, very well. And then came the PC revolution. In the 80s, the founder and boss of Amstrad jumped on the home computer bandwagon and became a poster boy for entrepreneurial Britain. Amstrad revolutionized the way that we buy personal computers back in the 80s. He entered that marketplace with vigor. Here's a man with 450 pounds to spend on a computer for his business. He can have about this much of an IBM PC or this much of an Amstrad PC 1512. He made the personal computer affordable to all. It was quite a revolution. Compatible with you-know-who, priced as only we know how. What would you say is the secret of your success? I never set out to have a kind of a Cartier, Rolls-Royce type business. The products that I sold were made for the truck driver and their wife. It was very simple, in your face, pile it high, sell it cheap. So really it was all sold on price, specification, that's it. Fred over there sells his product for £100, mine's 50 that's the deal. Nice fountain there. This is like the Trevi fountain of Boca Raton. Go get your bloody money out and throw a coin in there. You lost that. That's for sure. That is money down the drain. <laughs> Bentley and the Ferrari. <laughs> What's that? Right. Go give it a push out. Come on. It's got a proper engine, man. Oh, yeah. You don't mess about here in the sugar household, boy. Lord Sugar has a lot of toys. Turn the key, Sunshine. Yes! Do you think you're sending the right message to a grandchildren with it? Well, they can only get it on a special trick. Have you ever tried to get it? I can't, it's too big. Apart from identical Bentleys in each of his three homes, he also has a $30 million private jet. Blimey, like a house. Yeah, house on wings. Over here we've got a bar satellite phone over here. We control the uh, temperature of the cabin. You've got these screens over there where you can play DVDs on if you want to. Kind of like my sole luxury, really. I won't go through main airport to see. It'd get on my nerves. So you're prepared to pay over $30 million just to avoid the mundanity of, a, of an airport? Yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> It's clear that Lord Sugar is happy to talk about how he made his money and how he likes to spend it. But coming up, I find out a success has come at a price. I don't think she wanted money. I don't think she wanted extravagant homes or holidays. What she wanted was me. We get a tour of the house. I mean, I've forgotten myself here. What's this thing here, a piece of tool? Oh, I flogged that. And I find out what Lady Sugar thought about her husband buying a football club. One day, um, you know, she heard I'd, I'd got involved in Spurs. And she thought that was a bad idea. She didn't think it was a good one. And she was right, right. And she was absolutely <laughs> spot on. I'm spending two days with Lord Sugar at his luxury villa in Boca Raton, one of the most exclusive postcodes in the whole of the United States. How do you get on with Americans? Uh, generally very, very well. Because so. they don't know who you are. No, no, that's the good news. My opinion of the Americans I've met today are mainly in this mm. Florida area. And what opinion okay. is that? But what really um, annoys me is, is that um, sometimes when they ask me to speak English, I mean, to go into a, just turn up into a coffee shop somewhere with a friend and uh, just go up to the bar casually and say, I'll have one of these and one of these, and I go, what? What? I, in the end, I say to them, look, you, are, you speak English, I speak English. So let me make this simple for you. My name is Alan. This guy named here is Joe. Joe, he wants a flappy, schmappy, crappy, latte, smarty, whatever, and I just want a bleeding cup of coffee <laughs> with milk. The, the, they must think you're the rudest man They don't life. get it. They think I'm an Australian. <laughs> they don't get it. Now, I heard a great story about your last residence in Boca Raton. Yeah. Which is that you had lived there very happily with your wife, Anne, for a while. Yeah. And then one day, when she was out shopping, you sold it without telling her. Yeah. So Anne came back from shopping and you told her you'd basically sold the house? Well, well I kind of, kind of didn't, didn't spring it on her straight away, if you understand. <laughs> but, but what was Anne's re actual reaction? No. <laughs> we're not selling our, my house. But you've got to understand how we ended up buying that house, first of all. Well, we used to come here in the uh, early 80s with all the family at Christmas time. I went on the missing list for about an hour, came back and I said, I bought a house also. <laughs> 
but none of these decisions appear to involve your wife. <sighs> well, yeah, we've been married long enough. I know the way she thinks. It's like when you bought Tottenham Hotspur with that. Ah, yeah, yeah. She is normally utterly horrified when you do these things. Yes, yes. But you see, the thing is, the good thing about my dear lady wife is that she's never, ever interfered in my business dealings. You see, so houses, I take your point. You know, well, she lives I, in the house. I know I have to. I take your point. I should have consulted uh, and things like that. But as far as business is concerned, she's never really poked her nose into it until one day, um, you know, she heard I'd, I'd get involved in Spurs. Yeah. Mm. And she thought that was a bad idea. She didn't think it was a good one. And she was right. Really. And she was absolutely <laughs> spot on. The 10 year Tottenham era was hard for Alan Sugar and really can only be described as a failure. It was, he wasn't made for that sort of culture. In 1991, having built a fearsome reputation as one of the most shrewd businessmen in the country, Adam Sugar decided to save a crumbling Tottenham Hotspur, a team his family had supported all their lives. He wrote off the club's £11 million pound debt, and with manager Terry Venables, set about putting the team back on his feet. My first task, as far as I'm concerned, is to um, get the balance sheet into shape. He tried to project his businessman's knowledge onto the game, and... It just doesn't work like that. If the team was winning, the manager gets a round of applause, and when the team's losing, the chairman gets kicked around. And I said to him once, the best you'll ever get is when nobody's shouting at you. But a series of unpopular decisions, like firing the revered Venables, earned Sugar and his family the undisguised ire of the club's supporters. Got rid of Terry Venables and everyone hated him for it. And once it gets to the point where it's interfering with your family, and my Auntie Anne did get really unnecessary flack for that. It's so, so unnecessary that that's it. Shut it down. It's over. Sugar may have written the whole football experience off as a mistake, but it did tarnish his public image. How important to you is your reputation? Very important, yeah, of, of, of credibility and, and being honest. And straightforward, very, very important. I would say it ranks very, 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 very high. You know, I've done some silly things. I've said some silly things in my time in the football days. That's self-inflicted, if you understand what I mean. And if you were being really critical of yourself mm -hmm. for a moment, what would you say are your worst qualities? Um, losing my temper and flying off the handle. There are occasions when, um, you know, in the football world, my temper sometimes gets ahead of me and made some silly statements, and I might have said a few things that perhaps in hindsight weren't clever things to say. You like being famous. If we go back to the football days, um, and I was out and I was out in the street, you would get someone say, "Oi, sugar, you, <laughs> blah, 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 blah blah blah, get your blah 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 out and spend some money." Something endearing. Yes. Right there, yes. yes. So now it's a warmer reaction. Now it's a more warmer reaction. The youngsters who are kind of fascinated with me, and you get very very polite ones. Excuse me, Sir Alan. Would you mind having a picture taken? This don't I love your show, blah blah blah, and all that stuff. And the funny, the other funny side of things is the women between the age of 45 to 50, mm. who, if I'm at a function somewhere, they will come up and their husbands are kind of lurking in the background, gritting their teeth, like this, while the woman is saying something like, "I, I really love your program, my daughters, my sons. We sit down and watch it." Do you think you become a bit of a sex symbol? No, 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 no. I knew you were going to say that. That's you. I said. Well, a certain type no, of woman. No, you're, you're compared to you. Very attractive. Let's face it, I'm, you know, 63 years old and, uh, you know, those times have gone, you know. Well, they were never there, really. <laughs> but, uh... Is your private lifted? That's... Alan Sugar's current lifestyle couldn't be more different than where he came from. The youngest of three, he was born in 1947 in London's East End. Money was in short supply, and providing for the Sugar household was a constant struggle for his parents. But did you feel in any way neglected as a kid? No, no, not at all. I was a loner because I didn't have a younger brother or a uh, brother or uh, sister a year older than me. I was the 12-year gap, you see, between uh, my uh, twin brothers and sisters. So it was that 12-year gap, uh, which, you know, obviously there was a bit of a, a mistake, part maybe as a result of a euphoric night out um, post-war. Uh, and <laughs> I'll say it before you do. Um, and um, so, you know, I came as a bit of a surprise. Um, did, did either of your parents ever tell you that they loved you? No, not, I can't remember that, no. No, I can't remember that, no. No. Have, you, have you said it to your kids? Yeah, of course I do, all the time. Of course I did, all the time. You do, as you do it, you know, it's kind of a, 
day-to-day -day thing, don't so you? Do you think, did you miss it? Did it have an effect on you? Mm, you I didn't think? notice it. Didn't know no different. You wouldn't know any different, would you, really? It didn't show their feelings very much. No, no, uh, uh, cold. Yeah, I think they were cold. And people say that I maybe take after them a little bit, you know. I'm not a very huggy-huggy, emotional, kissy-kissy person, you know. Um, so it, it was cold. Now, I don't know where that comes back from, maybe. Maybe it goes back to from where they came. I don't know. Or how, uh, their parents or how they were treated when they were younger. Alan's father, Nathan Sugar, died in 1987. And in 1994, after a period of declining health, his mother, Faye, also passed away. I would admit now that, that as a young man, perhaps, I was selfish. When my dad died, my mum lived on for another seven or eight years. And, you know, she was in her flat, in her house, and uh, I reflected with guilt that I didn't have a round every, uh, you know, every, every, you know, every, every other day, or didn't give her my time. I don't think she wanted money. I don't think she wanted extravagant homes or holidays. What she wanted was me, yeah? Uh, and that I didn't give. I didn't give me. Do you regret that? Yeah, I do regret it. And then often says to me, stop, stop moaning to me. You know, even when she was still alive, I had that guilt while she was still alive, and she was like, don't moan to me about it. Get up and do something about it, you know? It's your mother. Get up and do something about it. And what stopped you? Uh, at selfishness and, you know, oh, I will do it tomorrow, but, oh, oh, no, hold on, I've got to go to work, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I'm tired tonight, blah, 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 I mean, this weekend. Selfishness, really, I suppose. Wow, this is, this is a dining room. This is a dining room, yes, it's very perceptive of you. Yes. What are these? These are... What are they? I don't know. They're statues. What do you think they are? Well, thank you, women. Yeah. I think I'd expect to find an Elton John's house. I think that, you know, they're very good ornaments. <laughs> Dog. Yeah. Doesn't look very like you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got the expression. Yeah, it's got a good expression on it. Miserable, his grumpy... Yeah, I like, him. I like him. I like him. I saw him in a furniture shop. That's a picture of you and the Queen. Yeah. You've got another one like that in the other room. Have I? I think you told me that when you found out you were being made a peer, mm -hmm. you actually shed a tear. Yeah, I did. I, I did, because I was thinking my mum and dad, you know, and how, what they would be thinking. Look, if you like, I, I, I know that you like to make people cry. <laughs> so I've, I've brought these out. I, mean, I can actually put some, <laughs> If you want me to put some tears on here, I can do that for you. It's, you know, I'm, I'm very accommodating. Very really. fine. Would you like me to do that? No, no, no. Yeah, so this is my office where, you know, I'm in contact 24-7. There's, there's a third picture of you and the Queen over there. Is there? Well, maybe I just, maybe I like her really. <laughs> She's my monarch. I like to have her near me. There's also a picture of you and Anne. Yes. I mean, how important has Anne been to all this? Uh, I mean, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better wife than her. Anne and Alan first met each other 46 years ago. After four years of courtship, the pair married, had three children, and in 2008 celebrated 40 years of wedded bliss. Anne was an absolute cracker when you met. Yeah, so I don't know what, I mean... You, well, you are batting way above your strength. Well, possibly, possibly. I was lucky. And I'd still, still, I'm still wondering what it is she saw in me. What do you think it was? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what it was. She must have seen that spark of genius there that, 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 uh, uh, that I have. I mean, is she the only woman you've ever loved? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. She did actually dump you once, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, it, the long and short of it was I wasn't good enough for her father, really. That, that was basically it. And I don't blame him, really, because I remember him uh, saying to me later in life, he said, you wait, just you wait till, you know, you have a daughter and you'll understand. Because what was I? I had a little minivan, a kind of um, a Del Boy fur jacket. I used to come around to the house and they were deemed to be slightly more prosperous than... than and they you were ill-mannered? Ill-mannered, most probably. Spoke a little bit with a Cockney accent and saying, my throat hurts. You were a bit of rough, really. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and um, and so he kind of, I think he put a bit of pressure on her. So so much so that I got a dear John letter one day. Dear Alan. Well, it's called a dear John. Ge generic. This one began dear Alan. Yes, it did. Yes, it became dear Alan. And what did it say? It just said, um, look, you know, we're getting. Don't, I don't want to get too serious. Blah 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 blah. Anyway, it was like that's it. How long had you been together? Um, eight nine months. I don't know, six months or so. Yeah. How did you feel? I felt gutted. Totally gutted. It's a broken heart. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Which means you must have a heart. Well, look, you know, um, biologically I obviously have got one, otherwise I'm, we wouldn't be standing talking today. Coming up, I find out how Lord Sugar feels about being one of the biggest names on TV. Do you think TV makes you better? The ID's taken off because they were drooping over here. And over dinner, I get to ask Lady Sugar about her husband's public image. No, it's definitely not going to allow it. It's much softer and kinder.
Do you like that? No, I like the colour. Like when Lord Sugar opens up, it's intriguing to see the man behind the hard exterior. So when I'm invited to meet Lady Sugar at a romantic dinner for three at their favourite Italian restaurant, I jump at the chance. Does he make you call him Lord? Or? No, I prefer to. And in the beginning, I used to call him Mr. Sugar. Yeah. Now I'm a first name, so Lord. That's, <laughs> Lord Vinny, that's how it goes. Does he actually know your name, Adam? No. <laughs> My first name is Lord. What was it that attracted you to? It was different. <clears throat> Very funny. Um, <laughs> Do you know what you are killing him tonight? <laughs> what with Vinny and you, he has had a wasted journey coming all the way out here. He wants <laughs> smut. All I want is the truth. No, and if that's the truth, the truth, I just have to accept it. Though I would say he has got some character failings, I'd argue. <laughs> we can be very, we can be very blunt, rude even. Well, he's, whatever he feels, he'll just yeah. come out and say, oh we yeah. He can be very yeah. rude. Does that ever embarrass you or not? Do you ever think, oh, well, Alan? Oh yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. I think he's quite scared of you in reality. I think ever since the Dear Alan letter, he's lived in terror in terror of getting another one. Because whenever I've asked him, like, when you bought that house, Alan, without telling Anne, or when you bought Tottenham Hotspur, or when you sold your house here, when you told Anne the news, how did, how did she take it? And the answer is always, not very well. <laughs> I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. And when he goes off and does these things, yeah. you must be furious. Huh? I am at the time, but in the end, it always works out for the best. It's worked out all right. So you've learned to kind of trust his, yeah, apart from Spurs. Apart from Spurs, yeah. Is that, was that hard for the family, Spurs? Horrible, terrible. Was the abuse that came with him yeah. owning the club? Yeah, and all I had was aggravation. We saw him in terrible mess over it all. And it was all for, for nothing. It was horrible. Why do you think your marriage has survived so long and so well? But we grew up together. I mean, you know, we prospered together. Right? I mean, she was there, you know, and so, um, you know, she, she go on, tell him. What? You always proudly tell people. Well, I used to earn more, more money, money than you. <laughs> when we first met, we used to earn more money than me. And uh, so we grew up together. So, you know, we did, we, we moved, we moved together at the same time. So I, asked, I asked him earlier how he coped now that he'd become this quite unusual sex symbol. Shut up. Have silly stuff. <laughs> oh, what Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> When Lord Sugar leaves the table for a quick chat to Vinny, it's my chance to corner Lady Sugar. When I was talking about it earlier, there were a lot of insightful things in his early life which I thought had played a part in creating the man that he is, from the rather cold way that his parents were towards him. And I thought that collectively, all that must have contributed to him being so driven. I think he always had that drive to do something because he knew he wasn't going to get anything from his mum and dad. He had to work to get somewhere. When I first met Alan, I could see there was always that um, coldness there. And he's just got warmer the more we were together. Did you see the coldness from his mum and dad? Oh, yes. They were completely different to, to my mum and dad. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. It was a big, big but do you, think he, do you think he was properly loved by them, or was it...? Oh, yeah, no, I'm sure he was. But he, they, they weren't found it hard to show, no, no, they found it very hard to show it. Which is a, a trait that he inherited for a long time. Yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. Has he ever got... Alan still finds it very hard to show his feelings. People watching The Apprentice, they think he's this kind of heartless I know, I brute. can't stand that. I, I think that's awful. They think, yeah. yeah, yeah, I really don't like that about the show. Do you think, do you think it, it's not the real Alan? No, it's definitely not the real Alan. It's much softer and kinder. Part of me thinks he doesn't really mind that image because if he did, he, he would stop doing the show. Yeah, well, obviously, he knows it's part of the show, so that's, what they, that's how he's supposed to be. But, uh, but it upsets you to see him. I thought, yeah, I don't like it. It's a complex character, I'd say. But it's not once you know him. No, no, he's not. Once, not, once he's, you get to know him, he's not complex in the sense of the, the persona that he allows to that's be out there. Yeah. It's like he won't let his guard down. <laughs> Early next morning, found me back at the mansion for a tour of the estate. But first of all, Sugar wanted to give me a damn good thrashing. Ah, excellent. You got your bat. Right, come on then, Lord Sugar. There you go, then. You ready? From Mount St. Morgan? Yeah. I never had to play this game properly. That is already apparent. Oh, come on. Oh, look there, Sean. I do hope you caught that. No, no, no. Did you get that, boys? You thought you were going to rock my ass, didn't you? You've been missing the balls, in not you? They won't show that. They will. Well, they won't show. Any of your winners? Okay. Ooh! Oh, I'm to tell you how good I am, isn't I? Watch it. Did you ball. just try and hit me? Yeah. Oh. Keep your eye on the ball, kids. Keep your eye on okay, it. Watch this, Grandad. <laughs> you had a mug, yeah? 
and he still can't do it. I'm lucky. My humiliation complete, it was time to see the rest of the house. Very nice. Yeah, it's a nice vaulted ceiling, yeah? It's mm. um, quite good views out there, and you can look down. You want to come up here? The shelves in Lord Sugar's house don't have many books on them. Even I've forgotten them or something. What's this thing here? Piece of tool. Mm, I fogged that. <laughs> and for an ex-hi-fi boss, there's a surprising lack of audio equipment. There are, however, a lot of very big televisions. In pretty much every room. But if you don't listen to music or read books, what do you do? Watch telly. I watch a lot of television. Um, what do you like? I like Law and Order. Fantastic. Mm. Fantastic stuff. I've got this PVR here. I set the PVR up when we leave. I put it on Sirius Link and it records, you know, a hundred of them. And I'm in my element, essentially banging them out one after the other. Do you love watching yourself on telly? <sighs> I, no, not really. I do, obviously, privately, when I'm editing or looking at the edits and looking at the cuts, I like to see how I come across. You don't sit here and re-watch great no, no, Alan Sugar moments? No, no, no. no, no. Not yet, mate. Not yet. Maybe when I'm about, please, God, when I'm a bit, please. If I'm allowed to live to about 80 odd, I'll sit on you, old oh, man, looking at. I was once on there on <laughs> television, you know. In 2004, TV began hunting for the British Donald Trump to front the UK version of a business reality show, The Apprentice. And Alan Sugar's life was about to change forever. There were a lot of more current candidates, Philip Green and Stelios, uh, from EasyJet and so forth. And in, in some ways, of course, he wasn't as current as they were. But after a day with the production team, they knew they had the guy. Not only that had the talent, but had the absolute passion for the past. When I saw the first show, I loved it. And who better to front it than my uncle? Everything that he does is, is completely natural. It's who he is, how he is, what he believes in, what he says is what he means. Um, and that's why when he walks into the boardroom, you can hear a pin drop. The series was a huge success, and Alan Sugar became a star. You're a lightweight. You're fine. With The Apprentice now in its sixth series, I wanted to find out whether being on TV had anything to do with his newfound interest in road cycling and keeping fit. Right, here we are then, Piers. Right, here we are. We're going to... And how far was he prepared to go to look good? When you first did The Apprentice, you were a lot chunkier than this. Were well, you looking at yourself on telly thinking... Yeah, you're fat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that was it. And I thought, right, one day, that's it. Was it you saying that to yourself or other people? No, me, me saying Were you that to reading? And my, and my, my, my sons, bless them, you know, who are also fitness fanatics, they would say to me, yeah, you're putting it on a bit, Dad, you know, you're getting a bit round here. <laughs> you're bulking up a little bit. So that, that didn't help either. But that is vanity, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you think TV makes you vain? I think, it, I think it must do. I mean, you obviously look at yourself. What other things have you done in terms of vanity? These were done, yeah. I had these taken off because they were drooping over here. Like what did that. you have taken off? The skin over the top there. Right. In Boca Raton, the guy, I, one Christmas I had nothing to do with a bad groin. Couldn't play tennis. It was Boxing Day. There was no one to, uh, <laughs> there was no one to annoy back in England. Because I phoned the office of this uh, surgeon and the woman answered the phone. Hello, doctor. This is surgery again. Hello. I said, I can't book you in for six months because you're so sought after. I said, no, I want it done next week. And they said, no, we can't do that. I said, well, look, just write this down, Sir Alan Sugar. Just, have you got a computer, young lady? <laughs> she said, yes. Yeah. Put, put it into Google, right, <laughs> and see if you can fit me in a little bit earlier. So I pulled a marker there. I feel ashamed. To what happened to you? She rang back two minutes <laughs> later saying, you Dr. Dr. Fiedel, we'll see you tomorrow, sir. But you see, some people will be looking at this shocked that you, Lord Sugar, has had plastic surgery to improve his looks. Well... I'm not ashamed to say it. I mean, that, that's all I have done. I'm nothing. I won't do anything else. You see, the beauty is here, Piers, is that you're talking as a young, virile man. Yeah. And in about five years' time, you will be going through the whole lot. <laughs> you will have the whole lot done. Because when it comes to vanity, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> to wrap up my time with Lord Sugar in Florida, I was to join him on a farewell bike ride on a ridiculously expensive bike. Look at this bike I've laid on for you. All right. This is the bee's knees, boy. How hey. much are these things? This is about, I don't know, $14,000, this thing. What? Yeah. You can buy a car for that. Yeah. Get on the bloody bike. Right, so talk me through this. What do I do? Which side do you dress? Sorry. <laughs> Which side do your cobblers lay, in other words? So what you're going to do is you're going to kick your heels back here. Yeah. You're going to stick the stick down. You're going to move mean? the boys around a little bit. Yeah. Move the boys around? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he hasn't got me. Come on. The boys are moving. <laughs> oh, <laughs> going around. Easy, Tiger. Is that all right? Is that good? Right. So you got my measurements. All right, let's have you hop on a board. This is heaven. Go a, a Come on, get on the shop. 
Ah, no, it looks, ah, it looks a bit much. Look at that. It's not good. Practicing. Send your Lance Armstrong pose. Bless the moment. Uh, Lord Sugar, guys. After the break, Lord Sugar stirs me, gets in my face, Morning. and takes me for a ride. Come on, Piers. I'm with you, all right. And back at his old Hackney Primary School reveals a different side. He's still crying. You want the serious answer? Yeah. I'll give you the answer. Lord Sugar has invited me to join him for a bike ride. But first, he wants to prepare me for the Florida heat. It's 85 degrees, so I'm going to make a power drink now. Florida orange juice. Cranberry, yeah. Final ingredient is salt. What? What do you need salt for? You'll be sweating out much more than that on this ride. Lay back. So, one more thing. I don't know. Yeah, what's the point? I'm, I'm going to do your neck. You're going to burn. You're going to burn out there. What is that? Come on. I've got to look after you. Close your eyes. Tight. Good. Jeez. Is that mosquito spray? Oh, yeah. <gasps> It's done. Just get a bit off. Get out. Come on. You won't even Just don't um, be careful. <laughs> you be careful, Grandpa. Don't mind about me, son. <laughs> Come on. He's too frightened. Lord Sugar regularly cycles 60 miles a day. Is that all you got? You could do it better than that, son. And has managed to lose more than two stone in the process. Is that all you got, Morgan? Come on. Very good. 20 miles an hour. How many times have you fallen off? Me? About four or five times. Badly? The last time was a big bang, was a bad one, yeah. What happened? I hurt my leg and cracked my helmet in half. Really? But I'm not sure he really ever stops working, even while he's on the bike. I have practiced my House of Lords maiden speech whilst riding along here. Really? Yeah, because you're not supposed to read it from playback. Yeah. You're supposed to stand up like a statesman and say it. So this is a good opportunity of doing it. In 2000, Alan Sugar became Sir Alan. And in 2009, the former East End Wheeler dealer, the bit of rough, who wasn't good enough for his father-in-law, took his place in the House of Lords. I've heard the stories that my papa didn't approve of my uncle, which is brilliant, just priceless. My papa was a real old-fashioned East End Jewish grandpa to me. And he would just kind of say, yeah, yeah, Alan's a lord. Can you believe it? You know, he, it's all that kind of, from such humble beginnings to go and become a lord, it's just incredible. So I guess Uncle Alan did quite well getting him on side. Yeah, that must have been quite a moment for them to see you as Lord Sugar would have been. Well, well, fantastic. Anne's dad um, did see me um, before he passed away, as did my brother-in-law who passed away also recently. In fact, they were... They were kind of both bound to wheelchairs at the time, but they were they were in the foyer of where I walked through uh, to go in with all the all the gear on and all that type of stuff. And I reckon that uh, Anne's father, he kind of he, he said to me, he called out, "Good luck." But I'm sure I detected a kind of uh, look in his eyes as if to say, "You finally done yeah, it." Yeah, all right, all right. Good enough. You, you've made your <laughs> point. You're good enough for my daughter. Morning. Come on, Piers. I'm with you. All right. Moving along. There's not really room for both of us, is it? There is. Come on. Not with that lamp post. Get over there. My time with Lord Sugar in Florida is coming to an end. Ready for the next ten miles? Don't you worry about me, mate. You're not even as best as Richard. But I still want to know more about his upbringing, his family, and what the young Alan Sugar was like. I'm certain there's more to learn. So he's agreed to meet me again, but this time he's back to the UK, to Clapton, in the London borough of Hackney. I'm taking Lord Sugar to the streets where he grew up. And to the very primary school he attended more than 50 years ago. Here we are. Look at this. First thoughts? Same. This, this playground is exactly the same. And this was the last playground that I, I can recall. See that gate over there? Yeah. My mum dropped me off as a kid, I suppose, the first time in school. And in playtime, I ran out the gate, wanting to, hated it, crying my eyes out, and really? ran all the way up there, all the way up that road there, all the way to the flats, which are just around the back there. Well, sobbing like a baby? Yeah, well, I was a baby. I was about five, <laughs> five or six years old. What well, a funny idea of you weeping uncontrollably. Well, I was. I was, I was up to scared the first time. But I'd never been to school before, so my mum had dropped me off, left me here, and I didn't, you know, I'd, Grown up with many little kids, you know. Do you still, um, still cry a lot? 
Yeah, um, you know, when I read articles in the Daily Mail, <laughs> they, maybe they last week to make Can me cry. Serious do, you, do you still cry? No, I don't. No. Never? No. Well, only, you want the serious answer, yeah. I'll give you the answer. Give me the answer. The last time I cried was because of the Daily Mail. Alan Sugar's taken numerous organisations to court. But in 2001, in the victorious libel case against the Daily Mail, he broke down while on the witness stand. I'm interested in how somebody who's as emotional as you inside. I know you're very passionate, mm -hmm. fiery, you take mm -hmm. things personally, seriously. Mm -hmm. You get emotional about stuff, but you don't really let it out very often. You know, sometimes you can get very low and depressed and whatever with people, you know, uh, letting you down or people saying bad things. You feel that you snap yourself out of it. Yeah. I don't want to make you cry. I'm no, asking if you ever do cry. No. Because if you cry, yeah, the, la you just, the last time was in the court case where I just broke down from a lot of pressure that had been put upon me. And that was the last time I felt no, the viewers have been to that because so far I've established in my time with you that you cry when you run out of the school. This you, school, you, yeah, cry, you cry when your wife Anne dumped you before you got married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cried in court with the Daily Mail. Yeah. I mean, it's been a non-stop saga of blobbing. I, I, I would say over the course of 60 years to cry three times is not bad. I put that on an average of once every 20 odd years. After the break, I get to the bottom of what really sparked that entrepreneurial spirit. Anything to do with making money legally uh, was, 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 of in, was of great interest. Did you ever stray on that line of legality? We revisit his childhood home. It was so cold in this room that if you had a glass of water by the side of your bed, the water would be frozen. And I find out just what kind of teenager he really was. Surprisingly, very quiet, um, wallflower type person, you know. You were? Yeah, yeah. Northlaw Primary in Hackney has been a school for 104 years, and it's where the young Alan Sugar first learned to read and write more than 50 years ago. So I think we should go in and meet some of the future Alan Sugars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's another question. Yeah. Were you happy at Northlaw? Very happy at this school. It was a great school. Lord Sugar, what advice would you give to help us succeed in life? The best advice I can give you is that while you're here is to learn every single thing that the teachers are talking to you about because all this stuff you're getting to hear now from the teachers is free. Who watches The Apprentice here? Do you think he's quite scary? No. no. no? What do you think of him on TV? He's a role model. Why is he a role model? He acts like them big people. Yes? Like <laughs> the boss? Yeah. Yeah? Do you think the things he says on the show are good things? Yeah, because before he like says... Um, that you're going to be out, he tells them you're good and stuff. When Alan left Northall Primary School at the age of 11 and moved up to Brookhouse Secondary, his family grew concerned as the young teenager became withdrawn and reclusive. In your book, you go into great detail about how you were uh, sort of ostracised by other kids. Tell me about that and how you came through it. I was with a group of youngsters. Um, we played around in the clubs uh, and all that type of stuff. They were... Um, clearly from families which were somewhat better off than mine, yeah. Uh, and I think it came to a kind of a point um, which surrounded the, you know, 13-year-old celebration bar mitzvah thing and maybe dawned upon them then that because I didn't have or wasn't going to have or they weren't invited to some glamorous kind of um, party which perhaps they were accustomed to in their families, and they didn't actually believe that I didn't have one and just had some little gathering in, in the flat. And they just went off, left, you know, so they're not, you're not my friend anymore for that, that, bizarre, that bizarre reason, I didn't do anything. I think they realised uh, I wasn't allegedly in their league uh, or that kind of people and they, and, and they went off. And how did that make you feel? And, and, that was, and, that, and that was kind of, um, it was uh, a blow really because, you know, you got used to all these friends and in the end you kind of shrink into a little shell at home and you don't want to do anything, and you don't want to go out and search for new friends and all that type of stuff. It was a period of a couple of years where I just didn't have any, any pals outside of school. And that's really hurtful. Yeah, it was, I suppose, because it should have been water off a duck's back, shouldn't it? Oh, well, these three pricks don't want to know me anymore. Fine, I'll find someone else, right? Um, but obviously not. No, but I think the fighting instinct kicked in in your late teens, when you came out of that period. There actually, you know, a few things happened to you as a young man the ostracisation from these kids, and your parents perhaps being a little cold towards you, that it all builds up and builds up and you get to the late teens and you think, I'm going to show everyone. How did you win around the, that two-year period? How did you come out of it? How did you get friends again? My mum 
uh, did what mums do, uh, observed this kind of reclusive child and started arranging people for me. Well, like arranged friendships. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, that's like um, the biggest lead balloon you could ever do. <laughs> I mean, parents arrange something for you. It's the most uncool thing you can think of. So that didn't go very well. And eventually, my sister-in-law's brother, who I did know. Um, through family association, took me out into the uh, marketplace, so to speak, introduced me to a few new buddies, and suddenly this reclusive person comes in and surprisingly very quiet, uh, wallflower-type person, you know. You were? Uh, yeah, yeah. At the, uh, standing on the periphery uh, and watching things going on, trying. And, you know, you can imagine being introduced to a new bunch of young people. This is Alan. Yeah, once you got past that, hello, how are you? What do you do? What school do you go to? Blah, blah, blah. That was it. They were off doing their bits and pieces, and I was still hanging around. But I even got to a stage once where there was some party somewhere, and, you know, things clicked then. Suddenly, I got the opportunity of breaking out, cracking a few jokes, and, and you know, breaking the atmosphere. And it uh, took a while, but then I um, finally got back in with a great group of friends around about the age of 15, and those are my pals still today. Brilliant. Yeah. Just five minutes up the road from his primary school is the council block Woolmer House, where the young Alan Sugar lived with his family up until the early days of Amstrad. Um, this was the, the first estate you, you grew up on, really? Yeah, this is where I, I grew up. I was born in Hackney Hospital down the road and grew up here. Um, that garage over there, that's where I bought my famous uh, minivan, a 50 quid minivan. 50 quid, eight, <laughs> eight pound insurance, third party fire and theft, and I was at the races. I used to park it over here. Um, and uh, start, that's when I started my real business. That's where Amstrad started out that little van. What do you feel when you come back here? You feel like you have warm memories of your time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to play over here. Because you were up to all sorts of stuff here, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the neighbours were a lot of my customers, actually. I used to take pictures and photographs. I used to make ginger beer and all that stuff. So really? they were sick and tired of me. Right. June Barker, now a sprightly 81 years old, was one of those neighbours, and she still lives in the area. 1935. That's these open. That's when I moved in. I lived on the first floor. And what was he like as a little boy? Cheeky little boy. Was he? Blonde hair. <laughs> curly, yeah, yeah, curly hair. That's curly blonde hair, really? Yeah. Was yeah. he always as rude when he was young? A bit cheeky. Was he? Quite brusque. Quite a bit cheeky. Yeah. yeah. Are you proud of him? Yeah, very. I just think, you know, coming from here like I did, I'm still here, mm. where you are. Yeah. When you saw Adam becoming more and more successful, what was going through your mind? Well, just uh, how clever he was. <laughs> Really? Did he ever strike you as clever as a little boy, or...? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you were the estate entrepreneur, even yeah. in your young teens, weren't you? As a youngster, uh, I would um, trade with this uh, rag and bone man just around the corner there. Uh, there was a lot of garment factories, little factories around the back doubles here. You used to have all these remnants of cloth and things like that, so I'd take sacks of them, get an old pram, the sacks of them, and sell them to him over there. And he led me over once, because he had a price for wool. And he told me that what I bought him wasn't wool, so he, 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 he screwed me on the price. I went back and checked with the actual factory owner, because he used to clean his car also. And he said, it is wool. And I had a row with him, and anyway, he threw me out, gave me another shilling and threw me out. <laughs> I'm trying to get inside your head as a young teenage entrepreneur. What, what was this the buzz? Was it, was it making a bit of pocket I was going to ask you, I mean, was, yeah, was, was yeah. money the, the motivating well, thing? Well, it was. We, had, I mean, we, we, we never had any money. So, you know, anything to do with making money legally, uh, was 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 of, it was of great interest. Did you ever stray on that line of legality? No, no. I mean, we, we, you know, one good thing about those days was is that you heard about kids in, in the block here uh, that did stray, as you put it, and ended up in a place called Borstal, and that was a really frightening, uh, you know, prospect. And so that's what kept youngsters of my age on the straight and narrow. How poor were you as a family relative to other people on the estate? Um, I think we were of the lowest, you know, poorest, if you like. But, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. We weren't on the kind of red line. There must have been poorer people. My father used to work in a garment factory. Uh, it was very tough in those days. There was no job security. You just got told on Friday, sometimes even Thursday, don't come in tomorrow. Was Thursday. that stressful for your dad? Yeah. He was a very, very big warrior. And never wanted to risk or, or, or do anything uh, risky, so to speak. So you have been a risk taker. So where did you get that from? If it wasn't know. from your, your parents, where did it come from? Uh, I didn't have a family or children to worry about. All I was doing was making a few quid to, so as, you know, I could uh, run with the hares and hounds as far as kids, were, as far as the, a youngster was concerned. Well, this is new. So, so the only thing that's new here is what? the lifts. Here we are. That was, now look, it's number 13 at the moment. So that, that is your old home? That is it. 
And I remember my sisters, my brothers sometimes, they used to pick me up as a kid and put my legs over here and they would hold me like this. That sounds absolutely outrageous. I think it's a bit dangerous when you come to think about it now. So this is it? Well, this is it, apart from the number 13. Well, I mean, we, we used year. to be number 16. Really? Yeah. First impressions? It's exactly the same. But this is, this is the kitchen now, obviously. But, and it was our kitchen, but it is amazing how small it is, really. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it. Up here. Yeah. Up here. This was, this was my bedroom here. This one. This was my bedroom. Is that how you remember it? Certainly not, no. Over here used to be a fireplace. And uh, there'd be sometimes in the winter where it was so cold in this room that if you had a glass of water by the side of your bed, which my bed used to run this way, the, uh, the glass would be frozen, the water would be frozen. It's yeah. been freezing in the winter here. Yeah, but, you know, you just dressed up warm, going to bed, you're lucky you had a bed. And, uh, but there'd be icicles on the window. Now, over here, this was my dark room here. Now, this photographic empire, what were you actually doing? Well... First of all, I had to black out the, the, uh, that window there with um, some towels or a bit of uh, some old cloth, stop the light coming in. My dad used to have his sewing machine around about here. He had a sewing machine there, so that was really his workroom. And there was a little bench here, and on there I had my in, in larger and duplicate uh, and, and things to develop films. And make who were you pictures. doing it for? Well, for anybody who wanted to pay. Um, I was taking pictures of the grandchildren of the, uh, of, of, of the neighbours along here. And, of course, once you've got a grandmother and you show them a proof of a picture with the word proof on it, written on it with a biro pen, she wanted the picture, wanted to know what the word, what, what have a written proof on it, because, I, you know, that is, you know, I'll make you a real one. And it's two shillings, one and six, and they would, they, and they would, they would, they would part with their dosh. Oh, you've got a shameless for it? Not really, no. It's uh, an entrepreneurial, I think. Absolutely, and many of them. I get letters these days from people saying, I've still got that picture you've taken of mine. They're now 27 years old, <laughs> and they've got that rubber stamp of you on the back there, photographed by Alan Sugar, Upper Clapton, 7875, that's the phone number. You can still remember the number? Yeah. So you're very early teens, and you're running a photographic empire. Yeah. You've yeah. got your wood empire. No, that, that, that was younger then. Let's get it in the right pecking order. I would say cleaning cars, right, wood, and also the scraps of, uh, of, of material. Mm -hmm. and to the rag and bone. To the rag and bone. How old were you for that? That round about that era, but you see... Ten or years old, that's ridiculous. Ten or eleven years old, ten or eleven years See, what's really fascinating to me, I think, looking at your early life, is that whereas most kids, when they were 11, 12, 13, would be dreaming of being astronauts and footballers, you have a, an entire portfolio of jobs going on. I had three children, and they never saw the kind of, um, you know... Poverty, I suppose, let's, let's use that word, that, 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 that actually forced me to recognise that my mum and dad, bless them, could not give me all of the iPods and the Nike shoes and the, uh, of those day and ages that, that, I, that I wanted. He wanted this stuff, and the only way to get it was to be entrepreneurial. Yeah, I mean, if I wanted a bike, there was no point asking mum and dad for a bike. It was not because they didn't want to give me a bike, it was they couldn't afford to. So, so I built one, or, or, I, or I bought bits and pieces to build them and all that stuff, you know. When you look back on how you've behaved professionally and personally mm -hmm. in your life, are there things you feel guilty about? Things you would do differently? Um, professionally, no. I think I've been very professional. Um, I don't think I've done anything which one could be considered to be dirty dealing or, or tricky or, or slimy or anything like that. I think, going back to my very, very first factory that I owned, um, I had, there was an incident there once where... <sighs> Someone, made, someone started on, a, on a, what was then a 16-year-old uh, black kid who was on the production line. He was fantastic. Like, he, he had so much enthusiasm, this kid. So much enthusiasm to want to learn about electronics. And there was this horrible, nasty, racist manager that I had at the time there that screamed at him to such an extent that he fired him there and then on the spot. Now, why I feel guilty about that here is, is that money at the time, which was my motivation should have taken second place and I should have got hold of that manager and kicked his ass straight out of the building. Where I made my, where, where I have nightmares over is the fact is that young kid who's now, must be 50 years old now. But at the time, the motivation was that this particular manager was an engineer, technologist, and the whole of the factory ran around him. So you put the business before principal uh, and you, and you wish you had... There were 20 people working in the factory, including my father and all that stuff. And this bloke was the kind of catalyst. He was the, the heart of what we produced. He made and produced. He, 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 he was the engineer that tested things. Without him, I had nothing. You know, we would have had to stop everything. But if you're being brutally honest, what you're saying is you put money and business before 
the terrible racism to yeah, the young. Yeah, right. on that particular, that's one of the things that sticks in my mind. Uh, and um, I got my revenge in the end, in the sense that, trust me, this fellow was out when it suited me. What would you say to that young black well, boy, I, who's I, obviously now 50? What would you say to well, him? Sorry. You know, that I would love to, you know, get hold of him now and said sorry, but I fear that he went off and must have thought this is just another typical white racist attack uh, on a, a, an up and growing uh, community in, in Dalston, it was at the time. Which it was. Yeah. I mean, that is yeah. what happened, yeah. 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 I've never, ever since that day allowed any form of that to happen in anywhere in any of my companies. Hearing about Lord Sugar's hackney years has been revealing. But how will he react to my take on what's really made him the man he is today? I would argue the running theme of your life has been that you've always been slightly on the outside. Outside of what? I'm coming to the end of my time with Lord Sugar. And the more I hear about his experiences, the closer I am to understanding his rather complex character. Look, this starts to bring back memories. Ah, and here's the assembly hall. I mean, all the classes would line up here in a row. Mm. Your class here, that class here, and that class there, blah, blah, blah. Did, did they have this when you were here? What's that? In PSHE, I can give a compliment. You spoke about the importance of giving compliments and being positive to one another. No. You don't, you don't seem to have inherited that trait. No. Of course, it is my hallmark now. <laughs> Do you feel quite proud yourself of the fact that you've come from relatively humble beginnings and that you've done two things you've, you've built this incredible empire but you've also i think retained all the values you had as a young yeah, man yeah I, I, I think that's good i think i think that's good i'm pleased with myself as far as that's concerned that i have managed to i, I think keep my feet on the ground really not not forgetting where i came from well, do you see yourself as still a working class lad yeah yeah, I, I, I do. And I don't like the fast buck merchants in the city, which, interestingly enough, there's a view that we never had here. Mm. In, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. That is the city there, yeah. there's the gherkin. And there's a kind of an era that grew up in the past 30, 40 years. I don't like that lot too much. So you've, I, it's I, interesting I, to me. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't rate them too much. That lot have made enough money out of me. I don't have to worry about them. Mm. And they, they, they like me when it suited them, and they disliked me when they didn't. And that's, you know, a harsh reality of life. But I, I would argue the running theme of your life has been that you've always been slightly on the outside. And that may have been one of the great driving forces behind your success. Outside of what? I mean, I think you have to define what, outside what the outside of, well, is. Outside of convention. You know, when you went to your next school, you had a couple of years of being a bit of a loner there. You were ostracised by mm. some of the kids. You've always been sort of outside of the city, despite being a top businessman. You know, even a football, you were never quite one of them. You were always slightly on the outside. There's a kind of running theme of the guy on the outside, and that may be what's been one of your great motivations. Yeah. Uh, I had lots of run-ins with the, the media as far as the football uh, world is concerned, and never conformed to um, what they expected of someone should be in football, and therefore was labelled afterwards as someone being on the outside. Similarly with this mob over there. If that's the type of place you think I'm an outsider in, I don't mind being an outsider, to be honest with you. How would you like to be remembered? I've often said to my <laughs> children, listen, when you put my gravestone up, um, whatever you write on it, there's a little headline we should put on there. He had to do it himself. <laughs> that's quite interesting. I mean, you, you did start business working for other people for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. and very quickly seemed to realise you had to be the boss. The day that I started working for myself was a, was a great moment in my life. Never. Wild horses, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't get me back to working for someone again. Never in a million years. Never. That, that independence, that feeling of, you know, um, self-preservation is fantastic. So hence, he had to do it himself <laughs> in, in Roman script or whatever you want to call it. And they spell it right. But you feel like now in your life you sort of, you need something new to keep you Yeah, I think, I think it's a very good analogy considering one time uh, chairman of, of, of a large you know, public company, then of a football club, then The Apprentice, then government advisor. What's next? What's going to come along next? So I, I'm just going to hope for that some opportunity comes my way because I'm not the type to sit around, you know, smelling the roses, so to speak. Perhaps course of psychology, psychiatry. <laughs> I could do a bit of ABBA and psych. 
That'd be a good, good company, wouldn't it? I could, do it? I could do a discount. I could do a 30 seconds, 30 seconds analogy for 39 I quid. I think the whole idea of having therapy from you well, fills me with absolute Think about horror. it. Amsite, right, 39.99 for half an hour, £399 for, say, like a day. It's not a bad idea. No, no, no. Am- your, Amsite, your only advice would be the same, wouldn't it? What's that? Just get over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite right. Get over it, you <laughs> stupid son. <suck. laughs> Talent show judge Piers Morgan will be back tomorrow night at 8 when he travels to Shanghai to meet the movers and shakers in a city which boasts 118,000 millionaires. Up next, it's our Clint Eastwood movie, Pale Rider.